this week on Hardwood Heroes. The postseason is in full swing and matchups are only getting better. Out of conference opponents rematch in the sectional finals and Hawking rivals battle for the third time this season. Hardwood Heroes starts right now. Further and further we go through the brackets, and the competition is only getting tougher. Welcome back to Hardwood Heroes. I'm your host, Shane Scalfaro. We've got everything from action to brackets to upsets, so make sure to strap in and let's get moving, shall we? We're kicking it off on the open seas. Lower the anchor. It's time for Marauders lead reporter, Lucy Schaefer. Shane, I'm excited to be ta back talking about Meg's basketball, so let's dive right in. The boys began their tournament run this week with ninth seeded Fairfield Union at home. Now let me be the first and only to say that it was truly popping in Pomeroy for the D2 Region 7 sectional final. Megs began this game with urgency on offense. We can see Owen Tracy drawing defenders outside to give Dustin Vance room in the paint to score. The Falcons also brought some fire of their own, including this play where junior Isaiah DeLong gets around the Marauders full court press, fakes out a defender and finishes at the rim. While play went back and forth, Caden Geem was a standout on the Marauders side, especially from beyond the arc, hitting six threes in the first half alone. The junior led all scorers with 22 points heading into the break. Behind Geen, Megs went into half up 38-30. to 30. Did the Marauders have momentum going into half? Absolutely, but it sure was a different story coming out. Fairfield Union's Caleb Schmelzer scored 28 of his 34 points in the second half. Watch here how he looks for someone to pass to, but then takes matters into his own hands and scores through a swarm of Marauders. The Falcons' defense overwhelmed Megs. Plays like these were a common theme. Fairfield Union dominated the Marauders 34-16 in the second half and went on to win 64-54. Wow, Lucy, intense game. How did Megs lose this one? Well, Shane, Megs has had to deal with adversity all season, so Tuesday's loss was due to many factors, partially because of injuries. In their third game of the season, senior Braylon Harrison went down with an ACL and MCL tear in their first game against BC. Freshman Reed Brenniger broke his hand against Trimble less than two months after ending his season. Senior Braden Stanley retore his ACL at Alexander almost two weeks later, and just four days following, Gr senior Griffin Cleland fell in their second BC game and wasn't able to return. That was a huge factor for Megs, but what else led to their downfall? So Megs only had six guys on rotation all game. Because of those injuries, they only had one senior on the court in Conley Burnham. It's easy to get exhausted when you don't get much of a break. So with Burnham at the helm, who else helps take some of the pressure off? We mentioned Caden Gein's performance. He led this team and will continue to do so next year as a senior. Big man Dustin Vance will also be returning. He had 14 points and five rebounds on Tuesday. Outside of Gein and Vance, Give us some names to look out for next season. So we've seen several young players on the court. Reed Brenniger will come back from his injury, and Landon Dewey's and Owen Tracy have made quite the impression as well. Not to mention that these guys are all freshmen. Coach Hill told us post-game just how much pride he has for his team. So I couldn't be more proud of the kids, and I asked them one question when we went to the locker room. Did you leave it all out on the floor? Every one of them said yes. Yeah. Head coach can't ask any more out of their ball club. It's been a pleasure covering this team, and we're giving our best to those injured players. Absolutely. Hope everything is smooth sailing for them. Thanks for the great work, Lucy. On a different voyage, the Vikings had a matchup with a familiar out-of-conference opponent. Let's bring in Vikings reporter Natalie LaFleur to talk this heavyweight battle. Thanks, Shane. I witnessed heartbreak on the hardwood for Vinton County this past Tuesday as they fell to Jackson. In this sectional final matchup, BC was looking to find postseason success against a team they defeated 67-51 on February 10th, but these dreams were crushed by Jackson as they set the tone early in the game and never looked back. Jackson jumped ahead to an early lead, holding Vinton County to four points in the first quarter. So it seemed the Vikings weren't on their A game, but what exactly led to that? Well, the Vikings were turnover prone, which left the Ironmen with chances to capitalize. The more Jackson scored, the more hyped up the Ironmen got. BC scored a total of 11 points in the first half, which is the lowest they've been held to all season. You mentioned the Ironmen were fired up, but it seemed like they were having a heat wave. You're absolutely right, Shane. The energy was rippling throughout Jackson's gym. Their student section relentlessly cheered and chanted all night, which fed the fire of Jackson. The Ironman's aggressiveness led them to defeat Vinton County 48-28 and the Vikings' historic season came to a close. 
fact, head coach NJ Kite is sad to see his nine seniors go and wishes them the best in their futures. I'm going to miss just not having practice with them tomorrow and getting to be around the team. So uh, that's how much I love this group of guys. You know, I, 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 I know our seniors are going to be successful with whatever they wind up doing, and, and I hope they know I'm always here for them. Some young Vikings definitely have some big shoes to fill next they season. They absolutely do. Can't wait to see how they reload. Thanks for great work, Natalie. Our first fan vote was definitely an upset, with only 19% of you guessing right on Jackson taking down Fitton County. Make sure if you want your vote counted, head over to our Instagram stories and vote on as many games as you'd like. In our second matchup, 43% are riding with the Bulldogs to take down Circaville. So let's see how they did, shall we? The Lady Bulldogs are rolling in on an eight game win streak and look to keep that momentum going. Let's see if they did just that. Athens reporter Luke Schmidt is here to fill us in. Shane, Athens traveled to Shellacoffee to take on two-seeded Circleville in the district semifinal. For the second season in a row, the Lady Bulldogs found themselves in a tough challenge looking to advance. The Tigers started off hot. Point guard Gabby McConnell dished the ball off to Maddie Blakeman who knocked down a three from distance to put Circleville ahead 7-0 after the first quarter. Ella Chapman ended the scoring job for Athens, weaving her way past Tiger defenders to make a tough shot in the paint. Speaking of scores in the paint, Maddie Blakeman had 11 of her 16 points in the first half for Circleville and bullied defenders down low to put the Tigers up 18-10 at the half. Athens struggled to gain momentum throughout the game, but their offense was rooted in Bristol Stump. Stump finished with 12 points and hit a barrage of threes to keep Athens within striking distance of the Tigers. Circleville held off the Bulldogs' comeback and senior Faith Yancey went coast to coast to silence Athens in the final seconds of the game, winning 50-35. A tough loss, but let's dive deeper into where things went wrong. The Lady Bulldogs found their footing in the fourth quarter, but it was too little too late to spark a comeback victory. Athens locked down the Tigers' leading scorer Maddie Blakeman of five points in the second half of the game, but could not seem to find any answer on offense. Circleville held Bulldogs guard Asa Holcomb to a mere six points and forced Athens outside of the paint. Shane, we've seen this team thrive in the paint all season long, and the Tigers' 2-3 zone forced the ball to take some tough shots from three-point land. Athens found their rhythm and scored 16 points in the fourth quarter, but their heroics were not enough to close the gap. Despite the tough loss, there were a lot of bright moments throughout this season. Yeah, the Bulldogs won the TVC Ohio for the first time in nine years, and made a strong showing against Waverly in the first round of the tournament. Sophomores Quinn Banks and Olivia Smart emerged as key players for Athens this season and only have room to improve. This team has gained some crucial experience that's really going to help them next season. Shane, the future is bright in Athens. Four of the team's starters were sophomores this season, meaning next year they'll retain the same group of key players, including Asa Holcomb. Athens will head into next season hungry to get back to this point and advance to the coveted district final. Yeah, we'll see if they can come back stronger. Thanks for great work, Luke. That's a wrap for our teams in Division 2, but there's still plenty more in the division to get into. Tim is here to break down everything D2 from top to bottom. Shane, we saw a couple of surprises this week in tournament play, so let's dive in. We start on the girls' side of the tournament. Circleville topped Athens 50-35, to and the Tigers will advance to play the Sheridan Generals in the Southeast 1 District Finals. Over to the boys' Southeast 1. The Megs Marauders suffered a 10-point loss at the hands of Fairfield Union on Tuesday, ending their season. And staying in Division II Southeast 1, Jackson defeats Vinton County in the sectional finals. The Ironmen get their revenge on the Vikings just 11 days after they beat VC in the regular season. So now we've gone through the first tournament breakdown, but the tournament is going to look a little bit different starting in the fall. I had the chance to explore how the new format will take shape. On February 15th, the Ohio High School Athletic Association Board of Directors approved a proposal that will expand the number of divisions in seven varsity sports starting in the 2024-2025 school year. Boys and girls soccer, girls volleyball, boys and girls basketball, baseball, and softball will all expand from their current four-division setup and will allow for up to seven divisions in each sport. According to Tim Street of the OHSAA, the decision for change has been in the works for years but started to pick up last summer. Uh, the conversation really started heavily last summer, and they talked about it a lot throughout the fall, and then that led to meetings with all of our member school groups in January, and they felt like they had everything they needed to go ahead and move forward with a vote at their February meeting. 
The press release from the OHSAA provided a scale for determining the number of divisions in a given year. The largest 64 teams will be Division I, the next largest 64 teams will be Division II, and the remaining schools will be evenly distributed among the remaining divisions. For Athens Athletic Director Eric Schultes, he says the change will create better opportunities for the student athletes. We felt like it was a better opportunity to provide more chances for kids to, to compete. And it's not even about winning a state championship, but when, when you know you're competing against a team that you can't even compete with in the first round, then it makes it frustrating for those schools and students. The plan for how each tournament will look has not yet been finalized. Boys and girls soccer and girls volleyball will be the first sports to take on the new format coming in the fall. To read the full press release, along with other OHSAA updates on the change, head over to ohsaa.org slash news dash media. Shane, I'll be back in a couple of minutes for our next divisional breakdown. I'll try not to have too much fun. Thanks, Tim. Let's keep it rolling with Nelsonville York and their first tournament game against Peebles. Let's bring in Buckeyes lead reporter, Donovan Varney. Thanks, Shane. This young Buckeyes team fought tooth and nail at their home court against Peebles on Monday night earning them a 44-34 victory in the sectional semifinals. Things got off to a slow start in Ben Wagner Gymnasium. Peebles took an early 8-7 lead, forcing NY to play from behind. Donovan, I went to that game with you, and things started to really ramp up in the second quarter. Oh yeah, they definitely did. NY ditched their famous full court press, which is not something we really ever saw them do during the regular season. Instead, they went to a half court 3-2 zone. And it worked out pretty well. It was a set they haven't shown much of the season, so Peebles wasn't prepped for it. This gave NY some momentum on offense as their defense created some turnovers. And honestly, I don't know about you, but I feel like I saw some tumbleweed go across the free throw line. Oh yeah, definitely. The first three quarters, there was only one trip to the free throw line both combined with both teams. This was largely in part to that zone defense that NY was running. It was pretty passive and they didn't get a lot of fouls there. But we spoke to Coach Gabriel after the game about how important it is to bring something different to the table come tournament time. We haven't really done anything with it all year till now. So, um, you know, it worked out very well. We've practiced and practiced for two weeks with it. And, and I told him we'd have to have something different for tournaments. And that's what we brought out. What a massive win but they had the next round ahead. Absolutely, Shane. And after their victory on Monday, the boys booked a trip to the sectional finals against the number two seed, Minford Falcons. Things kicked off with high intensity, and the Falcons got things going with a couple of baskets down low. Minford showcased an impressive zone defense that would force the Buckeyes to take their time to find gaps and open shots. But this was no problem at all, as they responded with three straight threes, giving NY a 17-16 lead at the end of one. Minford's size, advantage, and defense will get the best of the Buckeyes in the second. The Falcons outscored Nelsonville York 25-6 in the quarter due to the zone forcing the Buckeyes to settle for a number of shots from beyond the arc. Minford would be in the driver's seat up 41-23 entering the break. Nelsonville York definitely had some adjusting to do coming out of halftime. The Falcons proved they could maintain on defense, continuing to slow down the NY offense. Some big shots like this three from Cameron Sullivan did give the Buckeyes some life, but it just wouldn't be enough. Minford would cut down the nets in the sectional final, defeating NY 69-40. And Shane, I for one have had the best time covering these guys all year. The foundation has been set, and the future is bright for these Buckeyes. It sure is. Thanks for great work, Donovan. The Lady Spartans left Waverly with a win over Huntington last week. This time, it's same building, new foe. Alexander reporter Zach Swazinski was here to see if they did it again. Shane, this was a big game for Alexander as the Spartans faced off against the Portsmouth West Senators, falling to the three seed 42 to 31. After beating the Huntsmen and slipping into the district semifinal, the squad came into this game knowing it was going to be a challenge as the Senators had the height advantage. This was noticeable early on as Alexander struggled to reach the basket. The Spartans were shooting just 20% from the field entering the half. Jack, they've struggled with height, but the Tigers had multiple tricks up their sleeve. The Spartans were fighting against a tough press, causing Alexander to record just 14 points in the first half while Portsmouth West put up 20, 31. Both groups struggled with fouling, going to the line time after time. The Spartans found their rhythm in the second half and started to cook, knocking down threes left and right. So we know about their dynamic duo. But were they cooking in this one? Lily Ryder and Kaylee Hudnall were on fire yesterday, combining for 24 of the final 31 points. Make sure you remember these names for seasons to come as these two were crucial to Alexander's season. After the game, we talked to Coach Grinstead about the Spartans' growth. 
My kids put in a lot of work over the summer um, and work hard every day in practice, and and it showed. You know, um, from going from a one one win season to uh, I think a 15 and nine season is you know not really heard of a lot. So I'm very proud of them. From one to 21 to 15 and nine, what a turnaround and what a season from the Alexander Lady Spartans. Yeah, it was really a sight to behold. They should be set up for success for the foreseeable future. Thanks, Jack. The Lady Lancers had the game right after the Spartans, but let's see if the outcome was the same. For that, we have Federal Hawking reporter Charlie Lusk. Thanks, Shane. The Federal Hawking Lancers went to war against the Adina Warriors to keep their tournament run alive. We take you to Waverly for this intense semi matchup between Fed Hawk and Adina, and this game lived up to expectations. It was a stalemate until Michaela Nelson hit a massive three to make it 5 2 Lancers. The Warriors got a big bucket from Marley Holcomb to make it 7 5 to end the period. In the second, Adina used her physicality to get the cherry stripe with 8 of their 12 points coming from the line. 17-16 Lancers going into the break. Fast forward to the third, Marley Holcomb hits a massive three to break the tie, and Michaela Nelson says, anything you can do, I can do better, responding with a three of her own. 32-32, seven minutes left, season on the line, Friendly Cockrell attacks the rim to start a Lancers run. Takira Walker then makes a beautiful pass to Taylor Sneddon to extend their lead. Right after this, Friendly Cockrell swipes J.C. Smith and gets a breakaway bucket to force the Warriors' timeout. The Warriors couldn't recover from this run, causing the Lancers to win 48-36, and Coach Cottrell could not be more proud of this squad. It says we've grown up a lot in 24 games. You know, at, in the fourth quarter there, we had three freshmen, a sophomore, and a senior that played pretty much the entire fourth quarter. So, you know, to have three young kids, four young kids on the floor, and to pull off a team against a senior heavy team, um, or pull off the game, it just shows tremendous, tremendous growth. So for the boys, they're coming in hot on a four-game win streak. Did that continue this week? This week, the boys delivered in a big way, Shane, dropping almost triple digits against Glenwood on Friday. If you're a fan of explosive offense, this was the game for you. The heightened stakes of tournament play didn't seem to phase this Fed Hawk squad. We know about the explosive offense, but it seemed like everything was clicking in this one. Federal Hawking had all hands on deck for this matchup. Isaiah Cockrell started off with three triples in the first quarter. Andrew Arhart then caught fire as he has throughout the season, with 10 points in both the second and third. Then Tara Cockrell put the nail in the coffin for the Tigers with 14 points in the final quarter. This shows how well the ball flows in the Lancers offense. The Lancers had the pedal down, but where was the fall off for the Tigers? At the start, Glenwood was actually matching blows with Fedhawk. The Tigers were in striking distance in the first quarter with scoring from Devin Allard and Levi Cooper. But the speed and intensity that the Lancers played with caused the Tigers to lose track pace in this track meet. Federal Hawking lost this con won this contest 92 to 59 to win another sectional title. With scoring like that, Federal Hawking is certainly excited for upcoming rounds of tournament play. Yeah, I'm sure they will be. Thanks for the great work, Charlie. There's some heavy hitters in Division 3, but we've got to see how everyone fared. Come on back, Tim. There's another bracket for you to break down. Shane, you already know the deal. Let's get back into the brackets and see how it all went down. Starting with the boys tournament, Minford defeated Nelsonville York 69 to 40 on Saturday. They will advance to face Fairland, who took care of business against Belpre on Friday night, winning 61 to 51. Over to the girls tournament, Alexander falls on Saturday to Portsmouth West 42 to 31. And on the other half, the Federal Hawking Lancers upset Adina 48 to 36, and they will advance to the district finals where they'll play the Portsmouth West Senators. This game is scheduled for Saturday at 3 p.m. in Waverly. We've got one more division left, and we're starting Division 4 play with the Eastern Eagles. To kick it off, we have Eastern reporter Davis Stanley. Thanks, Shane. The Eagles were able to keep within distance all game in this tournament thriller, but the Wildcats had the last lap, winning 60-47. In Eastern's game against Alexander last week, the Eagles perfectly orchestrated the 2-2-1 press to create turnovers and takeaways. But this time, the results were much different. In fact, Eastern allowed 25 points with no press and 35 in the second half with the press applied. So Haley, the go-to press wasn't working, but were they able to respond? Eastern was not going down easy. The Eagles were down 10 when sophomore Derek Barnes kickstarted the offense. Barnes had three triples in the third quarter and ended the night with 15 points on five three-pointers. Barnes led the rally effort for Eastern and cut White Oak's lead to just three points at the end of the third. So did this resurgence help them get the win? Unfortunately, the Eagles could not keep the magic going in the fourth. The Wildcats racked up plenty of steals and scores in transition. A large reason for these turnovers was White Oak senior Weston Blair. 
where a scrappy play propelled the Wildcats to win. The senior forward scored eight points in the fourth while White Work outscored the Eagles 18-7 in the final frame, ultimately ending the Eagles season. Eastern head coach David Kite said this was a learning year for the Eagles with four of their five starters returning. The Eagles look to develop going into next season. Yeah, only time will tell. Stick around, Haley. Gonna need you for one more round. Looking for some more TVC basketball? Head over to Facebook and Twitter for game recaps and updated weekly conference standings. Instagram has you covered for highlights and action shots throughout the week. And for written content from every game, wub.org slash heroes is the spot to go. It's always been said that beating a team three times in a season is a difficult task, especially because the third rematch tends to mean tournament time. We've got Trimble lead reporter Haley Hollinger to tell us if the Tomcats were able to do it. Yeah, Shane, well, before we can get into that, we have to look at some points from Trimble's last game against the Miller Falcons that might trigger some deja vu. The Tomcats opened the season with a 69-37 win against the Falcons, and the last time these two teams played, Trimble won 74-43. Turnovers were a big talking point in that game because the Tomcats only had 11. Another thing we talked about was Trimble's bench. While they have six seniors, they also have younger guys who are essential to the team's chemistry, and that became evident in the Tomcats' second win against the Falcons. Miller was also partial to the 2-3 in that game, which, as expected, made a comeback in round three. Guessing that wasn't the only trend to stick. No, but while some trends stuck, the Tomcats overcame others, but let's just roll the tape. Early on, Trimble got a lead, but once they subbed their starters out, that's when Miller hit back-to-back -back threes, and that was their first and only lead of the game. Now we gotta look at Tomcat Chase Patton because he brought the heat after that with seven rebounds and seven points to finish out the first quarter. So did the Falcons keep running that 2-3? Trimble handled it a lot better than they did last time, especially in that second half. They got into a different triangle variation than they usually do, which created a lot of good opportunities for their offense. On top of that, their loyalty to the man press really paid off. They wore Miller down and they held them to just nine points. So it sounds like they were able to right some of the wrongs from the last game, but what about the deja vu moment you mentioned earlier? Well, get this, in their last meeting and this past game, the Tomcats only had 11 turnovers. They handled the ball well, and in turn, they found the rim more often. Michael Clark must have chose number 22 for a reason because he had 22 points to help his team along to their 70 to 39 win. And with that, Trimble won the sectional and will advance to the district semifinal against Portsmouth Notre, Portsmouth Notre Dame excuse me, next Thursday. Yeah, but funny enough, they weren't the only ones with a game like that. We've got Charlie Elenfeld, Waterford lead reporter, to help with this breakdown. Yeah, Shane, it was exciting out of the gate. Yeah, I thought I saw you sweating after that first quarter. <laughs> well, there was some heat in the gym, and that heat came courtesy of the Trimble Tomcats. Early threes had the Wildcats on the back foot. Yeah, they absolutely did, and they went up 10-9 to nine early, which was surprising because Wagner is usually so dominant. But once Wagner and Kendall Surrey got rolling, it was all Waterford from there. The Wildcats cruised to a 58-30 victory. But Charlie, let's go ahead and double back to that 1-2-2 defense because that's what stopped Waterford. And they couldn't really get many looks in the paint, unfortunately. Yeah, both offenses were bottled up to begin. I mean, let's take a look at this Waterford press right here. This game got sloppy early. There was a lot of turnovers and both defenses were suffocating. I mean, look at this press right here. Yeah, and what happens when you mix intense defense is you get some mismatching. And we saw that especially with Wagner and Ng. Look right here, you got one block and then bang, you got another one. She's just too big, man. That's just a tough matchup. And Kendall Surrey right here, 360 layup, 21 points on the night for her. She was excellent. I mean, just a total dominant performance. But we got to give Ng her flowers here because she had 16 points on the night as well, and she found ways around Wagner all night long. Yeah, Wilson saw a demonstration of the brightest stars that TVC Hawking has to offer for the present and future. Now, I assume you're talking about Suri and Wagner, and they do make a great pair. I'm excited to keep watching them work. Me too. Their district final game against Symes Valley on Wednesday is going to be fun. Yeah, thanks for the great work, Haley. But Charlie, still got one more game to go. So for the boys, they also had a familiar opponent for the third time. Yeah, the Wildcat boys had a season sweep on their minds as the Green Machine stared down their machine from Racine. In addition with the winner go home atmosphere of a tournament game, Waterford had some additional milestones to conquer. Head coach DJ Cunningham is looking for his first tournament win. He isn't the only one. All-time leading scorer Jared Armstrong is looking for his first tournament win as well. Back to full strength for the first time in weeks, Waterford was in a battle right away. 
Tough games are what Finn Pennick lives for, though. This coast-to-coast -coast layup in the and one was an impressive start to the playoff debut for freshman point guard in the third sectional final. The Tornadoes controlled the pace of play in the first, using lengthy possessions to claim a 9-8 lead after one. Despite a slow offensive start, Jared Armstrong started to get hot in the second. This three was a part of an eight-point eight point first half for Armstrong. Mid-range looks fueled Southern, and the 11th seed held a narrow 19-18 lead over the 6th seed at the half. Waterford made a major change at the break. A 1-2-2 press suffocated the Tornadoes, forcing turnovers and providing breakaway layups that swung the momentum decisively towards the Wildcats as they led 39-34 after three. Buckets continued to fall for Waterford. Alec Johnson's running jumper continued the second half sprint of Waterford away from Southern. Late foul shooting iced the game, and Waterford claimed the sectional title 55-48. Head coach DJ Cunningham spoke about his first tournament win. Uh, you know, it's emotional to get the first one, um, but at the same time, I'm extremely uh, excited for our guys. Uh, everything that they battled this year with the adversity of losing Chip Adams, uh, the constant injuries that we battled as a team. The Waterford Wildcats get another TBC Hawking rematch, this time the Federal Hawking Lancers. Yeah, and at the convo, should be a game that was very high scoring on the biggest stage. Thanks, Charlie. With that Waterford game, that leaves us with the final bracket to finish out with Division 4. Tim, you better make it a good one. Oh, I gladly will. These are some of the best brackets in the entire tournament, so let's not waste any time getting started. Starting with the boys Southeast 2, Trimble takes care of Miller 70-38 in the sectional finals. They will advance to the district semifinals and will take on the fourth-seeded Portsmouth Notre Dame. Over to Southeast 1, Federal Hawking puts up 92 on Friday against Glenwood and they've got a date with TVC Hawking rival Waterford. The Wildcats snuck out with a win against Southern on Saturday, 55 to 48. The Wildcats have back-to-back -back conference games to start their tournament run. And last but not least, the girls Southeast won. The Waterford Wildcats defeated conference foe Trimble, 58 to 30, and advanced to the district finals. Their opponent, the fourth-seeded Sims Valley Vikings of the SOC. That game is scheduled for Wednesday at 615 at Wellston High School. Now, episode six is nearly complete, but we can't leave without wrapping up one more thing. Yeah, we can't leave without announcing our Heroes of the Week. Switching it up as always, boys going first. Our boys hero once again hails from Stewart, and he's won this award before, but this is his first time this year winning the award. Our winner, senior guard Tarek Cottrell. The Lancers put up 92 points in the sectional finals, and Cottrell could not be stopped. Short range, mid range, and long range. He can shoot from anywhere, and when he does, he does not miss. Yeah, you said it, Tim, and make sure to watch out when he gets hot. You're going to get burned. Friday night was another 20 plus point performance for Cottrell, and he assisted on seven baskets as well. Good team offense requires a good point guard, and luckily for Fedhawk, he's got him covered. And don't forget about defense. Tack on three steals, and there's a clear picture of how he helps this team flow. Now, for the girls here of the week, we have someone who helped lead her team further into the tournament. And let's just say it wasn't a slow week in the Cottrell family. It's Lancer's Brindley Cottrell. Cottrell was hitting from everywhere on the floor and was a massive part of Fedhawk's win over Adina. She may be small, but wow, is she mighty. She's shifty and she's quick, and nobody seems to be ready for it. And if you look away once, she's taking that ball and heading the other direction. Now let's get into the stat line. Count them up, 23 points, five rebounds, and four assists. She was absolutely dominant on the offensive side of the ball. And I'd say she was just as dominant as well on defense. Eight steals and a block. We've been saying it all year, but she is a force to be reckoned with on defense. And now we're coming down the final stretch of the season. Players will only have a couple more opportunities for that signature performance. Yeah, and with so many teams left, the competition only narrowing down. Well, that's all the ball we have for this week. Be sure to stay up to date on our Twitter and Facebook page for your weekly TVC updates. Thank you, for, as always, for watching. And, of course, we're reminding you to be heroic. <laughs>